We've been studying 1 Corinthians, and I said when we first started this book that I felt like there was a lot of parallels between some of the struggles that the Corinthians were having and, and some of the struggles that we have uh, as a people. Oftentimes, there's, uh, if you read commentaries, they'll talk about the fact that the Corinthians was a, a carnal church, that they had given themselves over, at least in some aspects, to worldly passions. And it showed up in some of the problems that are addressed with them. I would argue that if you read any of the books of the New Testament, you'll find churches that are struggling to devote themselves fully to God. But 1 Corinthians certainly has some unique applications. Today is also one of those as we look at 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13. And there's lots to be talked about in it, and, and I'm sure we could. And, and I would always encourage you to understand that when we're going through these books that we're not going to cover every subject in detail. But this is not the last time we will study this book either. So it's important to understand at times that what I feel like God has laid on my heart at that moment or, or led me to preach on is not an exhaustive covering of every single subject that could have been covered in that section of Scripture. In this one, I think there's an overarching kind of theme uh, that Paul has. And that is that maturity matters because maturity is not all about yourself. Uh, maturity has a certain level of sacrifice to it. It's an understanding that the world no longer revolves around you. As little kids, we think everything happens because of us. But as we grow up, we're supposed to recognize that that's not the case, that there are different challenges and people are facing different levels of growth and, uh, and they may have come from different backgrounds. So he talks about that a little bit in this because there was a lot of the Corinthians that would have been very involved in idol worship prior to coming to faith. And for them, if they ate any kind of meat that was even associated with idol worship, it was like returning to that belief system and some understood the freedom they had in Christ and they ate the idol meat without any conviction for it but in the end it was better to uh, kind of forsake your freedom for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ and it's an important part that we have to recognize today as well and maybe in our country our country has a really hard time right now saying my rights are not as important as your rights. And if we could learn that a little bit in the church, we might be able to show contrast to them and how it works when we have something greater than our differences to rally around. So uh, today, as we go through these verses, we're going to cover some stuff before we get to the verses, but I'm going to pray for us. We'll open our time together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We do thank you for the country we live in and the freedoms that we have. And Lord, we're grateful for the flags that we surround our buildings with on holidays like this. But Lord, we also understand that regardless of the flag flown on the outside, you are the flag we fly the highest. You're what we worship. You're what we're grateful for ultimately too and we know you have greater things for us in the future but help us lord to learn that there are things we're supposed to do here there's ways we're supposed to live our lives out there's examples we're supposed to set there's ambassadors we're expected to be and help us lord to be those and to do it in a way that's mature and takes into consideration other people in jesus name we pray amen I titled this section, Maturity Matters, and, you know, when we uh, think about this, I think there are a lot of times that we think about lots of things. If you said, what's a mature person, and you asked, you know, everybody in the congregation, you're going to get some variances to that, but, but I would venture to guess that at least one of them that's immediately going to pop to mind is that we tend to think immediately of age. Like, the older you are, the more mature you are. And there's some truth to that. You, you have a, a certain level of experience that teaches you certain things, and, and you become more mature because of that. But that's not exclusively true. 
I've met 13-year-olds that were more mature than me, and I've met 80-year-olds that were a lot less mature than the 13-year-old. So it's important that we understand that maturity is more than just age. It doesn't just have age, but we do lend some things to it. I think it's an interesting part of some of the dynamics that we've been facing even uh, in a country right now is trying to determine what age someone's able to do certain things. We have plenty of arguments about it as far as that goes. But we have these requirements all around us. You're considered a minor until you're 18 years of age. All states divine, define a age of majority, which is 18, which is interesting. That's how we get the minor part of it. It's because there are more people in our society that are over 18 than there are that are under 18. So you're a minor because you're in the minority. It's an important part to remember. Persons younger than this age are considered minors and must be under the care of a parent or guardian unless they are emancipated. You cannot work until you're 15, 14 or 15 in most states, and even then you must have a signed work permit until you're age 16. You must be at least 17 to join any branch of the military. Even as an emancipated adult, I had to be 17 to sign the papers to go in. You must be 21 to legally purchase alcohol. You can be charged as an adult in a crime at 18, but if the offense is sufficient to warrant it, a juvenile case can be transferred to the adult court at 14 in most states. So why do we place these restrictions? It's because we are aware that there is something called cognitive maturity. Cognitive maturity, where your mind has reached an age where you can make decisions because you understand A causes B, B causes C, C causes, and so on and so forth. That you can connect the dots between your actions and the consequences of your actions. It's cognitive maturity, but that's not the only reason. It's also because three little things tend to pop into existence in this cognitive maturity. One is consideration. And that's a person who strongly manifests cognitive maturity, uses, usually understands that there are more people involved than simply themselves. They become a little more aware of the fact that they are not the center of the universe. So consideration is one aspect of cognitive maturity. Deliberation, because they certainly begin to realize that there are multiple options and that there are choices to be made, and not every time is a singular choice the right one. That in different circumstances, different outcomes may need to be done or worked out. Decisions are required. And in this point in life, when somebody reaches cognitive maturity, they're capable of making decisions when given multiple options. They can deliberate. They can look at the evidence and determine the path forward. Awareness is the next one, and this is just a, really what I've been saying in each one of those, which is an awareness that there are people around us that are not us and don't think like us. Don't talk like us. Don't act like us. It's also an awareness that the person sitting right beside you may not feel the same way that you do about a subject or a topic. To me, it was one of the things that became kind of a, maybe a, a sad narrative of COVID was the fact that prior to COVID, I, I knew that there were people in our congregation that had multiple different political views and Still on Sunday, we could come together and worship and, and see God as bigger than those differences and become a rallying point. And after COVID, that was much harder. We spent two years listening to an echo chamber of only our opinion. And then when we came back together, we were less tolerant of one another. We, we were less aware that there was other viewpoints around us. And it was difficult. It was hard to see. Brothers and sisters that love one another are suddenly unable to speak to one another. So as we read these verses, I want you to understand that maturity plays a portion in this, 
And he's getting to that point. He really is going to cover this all the way through chapter 11. Uh, but today we're just going to talk about these 13 verses in 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we who <laughs> through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food is not condemned to us, con does, will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Just to give a, a little bit of background, Paul is responding to some questions that the Corinthians have asked at least in the uh, previous chapter, and we believe here as well, or at least some commentators do, in a city like Corinth, there were many temples and many gods, and it was common to attempt to attend a temple where food was offered to idols. It was commonplace. It was all over the place. Food was offered to the idol in the form of a sacrifice, but some of the food was saved for those celebrating in the temple, and any leftovers were allowed to be sold in the marketplace. Many meals and or associations or trades would hold banquets at the temple. Some of that food would have been sacrificed to idols. For Christians to refuse to eat in such a setting might have struck unbelievers as antisocial and could have led them to think that Christians were not good citizens. So they might treat Christians as social outcasts, and some of them knew that, and they knew their freedom in Christ, and they went and they ate the idol meat. But then there was others, like I said before, that were caught up in that and had been caught up in idol worship for most of their lives who any time they went and participated in any of those things, it felt like they were going back to a previous life or a previous set of beliefs. The weak in 1 Corinthians were former, former pagans who were accustomed to idolatry and felt defiled by it. It wasn't that they were weak in their faith in God. It was that they were weak in the fact that their conscience still troubled them about their prior life. They would have grown up understanding exactly what was being offered and why. They would have felt conviction over it because it would feel like a return to their previous life. For us, that might feel like a return to a particular habit or a particular vice. If you grew up in another religion, it could even feel like you were returning to that God. The point is this, while we know that these idols are nothing, what we know is not the most important thing. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are the most important thing. In this instance, that's why he is saying, in a roundabout way anyway, that maturity matters. And how does it matter in these verses? Well, we're going to talk about the three things a minute ago, consideration, deliberation, and awareness. And First, we're going to talk about consideration and how it works itself out here. He asks the question, what will edify my brothers and sisters? And we're supposed to do that. 
We're supposed to think about our brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we're about to assert some freedom we have in Christ, we need to ask the question, how will this affect my brothers and sisters in Christ? We take into consideration other people. We think about who they are, where they are. One of those issues would probably, uh, at least at times, have been alcohol. It's the easiest example, anyway. Whether or not Scripture says you will immediately go to hell if you have a drink is not the point. The point is whether or not there is someone beside you that has struggled with alcoholism and your permissive attitude towards it might encourage them to go back to a sin that previously distracted them from God. That's what he's talking about here with idle meat. He's saying you should remember and think about what's going to edify your brothers and sisters, not just the freedom you have in Christ. The mature realize that knowledge is not enough. I'm sure that we have all at times had an argument with someone who has a head full of book knowledge and not a lick of common sense. It's good of you to admit that. <laughs> but the, uh, <laughs> knowledge is not enough. There's a fundamental teaching here that Paul's trying to get to and particularly for the mature, and that is love is greater than knowledge. Knowledge simply makes you feel full. That's why he says knowledge puffs you up. But knowledge doesn't take into consideration your brothers and sisters in Christ. You can know all kinds of things and still lack love. And in that, you are not as mature as you think you are in Christ. If knowledge is still the main definer, you've gotten it wrong. We know that because we live in a country that 86% of people still say they are Christian. And it's because they have a knowledge of the church, and they have a knowledge of who Christ is, and they have a knowledge of church practices and family traditions, but their life lacks love for Christ and love for their brothers and sisters. Knowledge can make us feel full, but it doesn't do what, we were in, what it was intended to do. Love is greater than knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. The word puffs up surfaces a number of times in this letter. It's in 4.6, 4.18, 4.19, 5.2, showing that the arrogance of the Corinthians was a major concern for Paul. Mainly because pride inflates the self. It's narcissistic and self-absorbed. Love, on the other hand, is others-centered and is concerned with building up and strengthening others. Knowledge should not become an instrument to advance oneself, but should be a vehicle for helping others. Love takes others into consideration. Love, in lots of ways, is knowledge rightly applied. When I was still doing carpentry, we had a young kid that uh, had gone through school for that, actually, and he was a truss builder, and he knew how to lay out the trusses for a house. Have you ever seen one of those? They can have integral webbing and different kinds of support systems that are built into them. They they use a big flat nail called a gang nail that holds all this stuff together. It gets put in on one big fail stomp. It's like a big stamping machine that puts them in. The problem for him was that he had all this knowledge in his head, but he had forgotten about applying it rightly. So even though he knew that the house we were building had an attic in it, he built trusses that were not made for an attic and the webbing had to all be cut out and we had to go back and redo all the work that they did because he had the knowledge but he applied it wrongly. He knew the right thing to do, he just applied it in the wrong place at this time. And sometimes we do the same thing. 
When we rely too much on knowledge, there's always the chance we're going to use the knowledge to try to bully rather than support or build up. So it's important that we understand that love takes others into consideration. Knowledge tends to take us into consideration. It's good to learn. It's good to know the things that we're taught. It's good to memorize Scripture, to understand the mechanisms of the church. It's good to do all of those things. But it's not the greatest to do all of those things. We still need to make sure that knowledge, that we practice love, which is that knowledge applied rightly in our circumstances. That's why Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, right there, he would be in a perfect place to say, outdo one another in showing knowledge if knowledge was the key. But knowledge is not the key. It might be a mechanism or a way to unlock the lock, but it is certainly not the key. Galatians 6.3 says, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. And sometimes we get too smart for our own good. I remember more than one time as a kid, my granddad particularly telling me I was entirely too smart for my own good and he was right and too often the scriptures are telling us we're too smart for our own good and we fail to hear it we still think knowledge is power but love is so much more powerful than that Maturity considers others above themselves. So there's consideration in all those aspects. Next is deliberation. If you look at the verses 4 through 6, those who understand that God is one also realize that idols are nothing. They understand all of the plethora of options that are out there, but maturity is able to look at those things and say they're false and that God is true. We may always consider others, but believers live for God's sake through Jesus Christ. And it's important that we remember that. Because there will be multiple choices in our life. Much like the Corinthians had lots of gods and little lords to look at and try to pick out which one they wanted to worship, our world certainly presents to us all kinds of different things which are either supposed to be God in our lives or take the place of God in our lives. And as mature believers, we need to be able to discern or deliberate enough in our minds to determine what's the right thing, which direction should we go. We should be asking the question, even with all the knowledge that we gain, what will glorify God? He's trying to warn them in these verses that sometimes even the freedom we have in Christ doesn't bring glory to God. One of the greatest things about being a Christian for me, especially the longer that I've been one and the more I understand about God and who He is, is that there is not a single thing that I can add to what Christ has already accomplished. Not a single thing. And that there's not a single thing I can do that will undo what Christ has done already but my knowledge of that shouldn't lead to my abuse of that nor should it lead to my willful hurting of my brothers and sisters in the freedom I have in Christ we have to recognize the options ahead of us and make choices that bring glory to God and sometimes that means we don't eat the idol meat because someone else is convicted by it. And we're supporting our brothers and sisters regardless of whether or not we recognize the freedom we have in the circumstance. Next is awareness. Those who are aware of such fundamental and foundational truths are summoned to live them out through sacrificial love for the weak. So when we recognize those foundational truths about the freedom that we have in Christ about the accomplishment 
of his sacrifice and his grace and his redemption and the permanency of that and the perseverance of the saints, you'll hear it called, or once saved, always saved. Even when we recognize those things, we're not to abuse them and act in such a way that reveals our immaturity in Christ by hurting others around us with them. Maturity comes with awareness that you are not the only one that matters. You're not even the most important one. The more I grow in the Lord, the more I understand the freedom I have within it. But when I take advantage of that, I am not showing maturity. I'm showing immaturity. Food sacrifice to idols is not really the issue for Paul. He'll dress it more in ten, and he'll even in ten, he'll outright say we shouldn't do it. But his point is not that, and we'll see this as we go through the, the next couple of chapters even, that his point is if you are a believer who knows Christ and knows all the freedom that you have in Christ, who knows the redemptive power of the cross, who understands everything that God has done for you, you still have to consider your brothers and sisters in Christ in your exercise of that faith. That there are going to be people that are not as far along on the trip as you are. They're not going to understand it nearly as well. Food sacrifice to idols was not the real issue. The word for food sacrifice to idols is different when the Jews use it, which was really just a food offered in temples, but the term is never used in pagan sources, that same word. Pagans used a different word, which meant food sacrifice to a divinity. The Jews never used that word. And the reason why was because they knew that the idols weren't real. All of the false gods in the world are just that, false gods in the world. There is one God. We worship Him. One Lord, Jesus Christ, and we worship Him. And Paul understood, and he hoped that the Corinthians understood, that these were not real entities. But that didn't mean that the conscience of some wasn't still troubled by those things. We see it today. There's plenty of things in, in our lives that we have conviction over that other people don't have conviction over. That God is working specifically on you in your life. Part of the beauty of being a body of believers is that we're able to edify and build one another up as we go through our differing trials. But not if we're not mature enough to reach a hand back for our neighbor when they're struggling. Or to avoid the freedoms we think we have achieved when it best suits the person sitting next to us or behind us or passing us in the hallway. We can all understand to some degree what Paul is really saying here. Each of us has some knowledge imparted to us that we do not fully grasp until later. Some of these believers that he's calling weak knew and understood completely who God was, what he had done, that he was the only God. But that didn't mean that they were fully there yet. I used an analogy last week where I said my granddad used to tell me that if you wore a white shirt to, re to work on a greasy motor, you're going to get a lot more grease on your white shirt than the white will get on the greasy motor. And I remember at the time thinking, that's the stupidest analogy I've ever heard in my life. But as you grow, you find that to be very true. When we put ourselves in bad circumstances, more often than not, the bad circumstances impact us more than we impact the bad circumstances. I didn't understand when I was young why I couldn't have certain things. I knew it. They told me plenty of times. You can't have that yet. You're not old enough to handle it. But I had to get some time and distance before it became something I believed in, not just knew. Not just knew. 
I remember them telling me it was important who you hang out with, I, who you follow, where you go, all of those different things that when I was young, I knew them, I could recite them if they asked me to, but they hadn't become true in my heart yet. And we are always going to be worshiping with people that are on different levels of their relationship with God. And it's important that we remember that even if we have imparted all the knowledge in the world to them, it may not yet be here. And if it's not here, we should restrain or refrain from exercising some of our rights that might trip them up in the process. Overall, he wants us to understand that our attitude towards the idol and toward our brother and sister is the main issue. While they may not yet know that they have the freedom that they have, the stronger believers were supposed to be mature. They were supposed to be reaching back to help their brothers and sisters in full consideration of them, understanding the choices and deliberating and making the right one that would bring glory to God, being aware of the fact that their, their desire or their right was not the most important thing in the room. If we're going to do this together as a church, we're going to have to learn that same lesson that he's trying to teach the Corinthians. Maturity matters. We need maturity in our lives as we approach God, and we need it in others' lives as they help us learn how to live out the faith that we proclaim. Because when worlds collide, when all of the things that come in around us every day that come and challenge the beliefs that we say we hold, temptations abound, and we're going to need people that are willing to come along and say, let me help you through this. We're not going to need as many people that come along and say, you should have known better. Maturity matters. We're supposed to grow in the Lord, but one of our primary concerns as we do so is how is everybody else growing in the Lord? How are our brothers and sisters progressing? And are they living out the faith in a way that God brings honor to God? Not about whether or not we've gotten to activate every right we think we have.